I don't think academy football is all it's cracked up to be. And I'd love to see the studies. I, I think that the FA should be conducting studies if they're not conducting studies. And I'd love to see how many your players are taken into academies at eight and nine years of age. How many of those players make a debut? How many players at 12, 13, 14, 15 even go on and make a debut? I don't think it's one a year in most academies out of squads of 20, 24 players. Bayern Munich have just got rid of all of their players from 11 downwards, which tells me that there's something in that later recruitment. There's something in maybe being a bit more patient. But the game doesn't care. The game really doesn't care whether these lads are, are cast aside and there's no unity in the game. There's no desire from the game as a whole because there is no game as a whole. There's this club and this club and this club and this club and it's every man for themselves. Players get caught in this and players are the ones that suffer in the middle of this and a couple of months ago there was the, the tragic case of that young lad at City that took his own life. He's not on his own in young lads that are struggling to deal with the pressures, the expectation of family members and parents and coaches and being a footballer. It was from young. Um, I've always wanted to play football from such a young age, about four or five years old. I uh, lived in an estate where a lot of my friends would go and play football, uh, knock on the door, come to play out. So yeah, literally, and then I went into primary school, secondary school, I kind of got used to being the guy that played football, the guy that was good at football, school football team. Um, so yeah, it was always part of the plan to make it my profession. So as a little boy, um, I feel like I did want to be a footballer, but I've always been interested in like creative type things like fashion, you know, drawing, art, stuff like that. So I was always interested in that. I feel like because football was so fun and it just came so like naturally at the time. It was something I started to pursue even more. I've wanted to be a footballer from as long as I can remember really. From the moment I was about five, six years old from the Cliff United, I'm sure people know all about that. But um, Fletcher must range as well, being taught <laughs> little Saturday school. It's, I remember it quite vividly for being so young, which pretty much represents how much I did not did because I do still love football but I guess the passion for it went a little bit but for as long as I remember I always wanted to be a footballer because I thought dream job getting paid for doing something that you love can't go wrong I think it's more like a passion that I kind of inherited myself more than anything obviously not really having the usual kind of family life in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a sense with it just being my mum but I think if you're getting called Ronaldo, I think it's almost destined for you. Everyone thinks Premier League footballer, Lamborghinis, agents, millions of quid. The dream's a real dream because it's such a, it's, it's such a big win if you get to be one of those chosen few. Is it 1% of kids? Well, that means 99% of kids are being absolutely cast aside. Um, the transition from football being a passion to it being career-based or something that you're looking towards more happens when things start to become full time and that was more so my olden days than when I was at Liverpool but Liverpool did feel a little bit full time because it was training every day but it was in the evenings it was after I went to school and the everyday aspect or the full time aspect came from the fact that it was literally school ended and I had to make my way in my uniform almost because I lived so far away so it was definitely like a full time commitment. I can tell Ronaldo's been through the ringer now, he's pretty stoic on the outside. He's fairly quiet. But you can tell that there's a time when he snapped. And you can tell that he, there was a time he made a decision. And I think the decision he made was largely down to his own 
realizations. Maybe he wasn't good enough. Maybe he wasn't getting along with coaches. He's never really opened up a lot on what the exit sort of process was for him. But I know that Ronaldo had a large part in his own decision. You losing passion usually happens for people that play football when things start to go not go your way and you start to face a little bit of adversity. You start wondering if it's for you because for people that haven't been in the industry or haven't experienced it, they think being a footballer or playing football is all rosy and it's all easy. It's a nice life and an easy life and it's far from it. You've got to be mentally tough and you've got to be on it, like you can't slack. And people majority look at the, the big luxurious players, but for people that are in, for the majority, which are actually in league football, like League One, League Two, Championship, some of these players are playing every day for their livelihoods, like nothing's ever guaranteed. It's not all five year, six year contracts and being comfortable. Um, this is every day for some people and they have a lot of people relying on them. A lot of people look up to them and sometimes they kind of fall underneath the weight of the expectation. I feel like I felt that a little bit as well. So it's, it, it is tough, but it, it's worthwhile in a sense because you do enjoy playing, but when it does get to the political side and, and the competitive side of it and knowing that you've got to do this in order to have a career and, and have livelihood, a livelihood, it can be a little bit of a, of a difficult situation sometimes and it's obviously a hurdle that you've got across in football and I had to go through it and I'm sure a lot of people did as well. He was in the same academy as Trent, as Woodburn, as Jan Dander. These are players that are playing Premier League level now, some of them playing for England. He was clearly at some point of that sort of level, if not the same kind of level as them guys. And you're going in every day and you're having to run, you have to do extras and you don't feel like you're part of the first the first choice 11 so on um, it, can, it can be tough and I know because of, and the reason why it is tough is because when we play football obviously we care and we care about playing we care about the team but we care about how we can contribute and if you feel like we're not contributing then that's when you can start to wane a little bit in terms of your confidence and it, and it can affect you but what happened was I didn't play football for three years when I was about 19 because I went and studied at university at Loughborough for three years and it was funny because Loughborough University is obviously a very illustrious sports uni, probably the best in the world and um, they asked me to play first team because they knew my football and history and my, my pedigree and I was open with telling them that I didn't want to do that because I didn't want to go, for, oh, I wanted a little bit of a break from dedicating pretty much 18 years of my life solely to football, I made so many sacrifices um, to pursue a football career, I thought at this time that I'd try and do something else for a little bit and for three years I dedicated to looking at my degree and that kind of progression in journalism more than anything. Ronaldo made the decision he wanted to become a journalist. I think he used PFA bursary to become uh, a journalist and, and use that to, to start this new path, this new career change and I admire him for having the balls to do that. And I think the experiences that he's had in the academies, both at Oldham and at Liverpool, I think it's going to stand him in such a good stead when he becomes a journalist. He's going to be so much more relatable to the people he interviews. And he's becoming a good journalist. His writing's getting really good. His interviews on the Tier 1 podcast, they're really good. He is becoming a good journalist. And I think because he had a large part in making his own decision that this probably isn't going to be what I thought it was. And he was mature enough to go, I need to move and, and fix into something else. And I did it myself. I was an academy player myself until 21. Up until I was 18, I was with Salford in the Super League. I got released from Salford and I joined the army. Um, that was the kick I needed to join the army. Once I'd got through my basic training in the army, clubs came calling again and I spent a season with Keithley and a season with Doncaster in what was the, the championship and essentially League One at the time um, of Rugby League. So I understand that I came to the similar sort of thing and I don't hold any resentment. I just realised I wasn't good enough. And it like, wasn't a bad injury. I can imagine a player who's had a bad injury has got a bad vibe about it, maybe a bit of resentment about it, maybe, oh, I could have done this. I just knew. Like, I was decent, but not good enough to go professional. And maybe Ronaldo is in the same kind of 
sort of mindset as that. Since we started playing this season, I know that there's a lot of clubs that have come and offered him money to go and play. And I, I, I do find myself laughing. He's just going, nah. He's just not interested. He's not interested in going and playing at that high level. Maybe he would go along with the journey of wherever Stratford Paddock ends up, and he might play at you know, a, a comparative level to some of those teams eventually. But I think he's right now enjoying his football because he's surrounded by his teammates. Yeah, it feels it feels good, but it also <laughs> it feels like they they, um, they can do certain things and get away with it. playing with the likes of Oki, Isaac, Trey, and so on. I guess it's good because you can give him a little bit of stick, or you can be a little bit more aggressive with him in terms of your communication and what you want on the field, without him taking it personal because he's a mate. So at the end of the day, what happens on the pitch stays there. But in terms of the enjoyment factor, I think you're on each other's wave, wavelengths, you understand each other's style of play. And there's a level of enjoyment, and obviously because you're playing with your mates, caring about your teammates is very, very important in any team sport, and that's not just football. And when you get that level of unity and cohesion, that's, that's the makings of a really dangerous team. And that's what you're trying to create here at Stratford Palette. Yeah, um, so I like, played and trained with my mates every week, it's like, it's something I've like, obviously I've, I've always had mates that like teams, but like obviously Oki being at Liverpool, Ronnie being at Liverpool, um, Isaac was at City, but obviously he was like the year above me. So we played together, trained together sometimes, but not like, I don't think we actually even played a game together to be fair, because Isaac always played up and then if I played up, he would be elsewhere. Um, so it's like all of us coming together, it's like, surreal really like it's different we didn't we didn't really expect it to happen so that make, that's why it's more fun and then like obviously making friends with like all the, the rest of the team at Paddock and it's like it's really good atmosphere to play in you know we really enjoy our football I think like it took us quite a while but like understanding each other on the pitch and off the pitch and like our personalities and stuff like that so you know I feel like everybody really gels here and when it's time to get serious we're serious but like everybody can have a laugh as well. I was born in Nigeria I uh, moved to Manchester when I was, I think, six years old. And then I actually started playing football for a local team when I was about eight years old. And um, I'd say a big influence for me when I first started playing football was um, I had a football coach. It's called Tom Ward. Um, so he coached me at a team called Clayton Villa when I was young. And, um, you know, I still stayed close to him right through till now. So he was a really big influence on me, you know, when I was young playing football, taught me stuff I know, like I remember playing football with me, his son Cade, who mean, I'm still best friends with now, you know, playing football in cages with them, you know, working on my touch work and stuff like that. So he was a really big influence for me. I was really enjoying my football there actually. And like, obviously when you're young, like you get loads of scouts coming to the games and tournaments and stuff like that. And um, fortunately for me, Clayton Villa, we went to like, we had a big squad, so we got to go to every tournament there was. So um, I first got scouted by uh, Blackburn when I think I was around nine nine years old, so I'd been playing for Clayton for about maybe two years, something like that. Um, and I went to Blackburn, and I remember traveling from Manchester to Blackburn after school, I was still in primary school, so we travel after school to train and get back late. Um, and yeah, I was at Blackburn for quite a while, and then I got scouted for Liverpool as well. So I was playing for Blackburn, playing for Clayton as well, because um, I can't get enough football. And then I got scouted for Liverpool, then it was Blackburn, Clayton, Liverpool. And then luckily at the time, um, just as we were thinking, you know, this traveling's quite a bit, um, Man City came and they scouted me. And I remember um, they took me for a game with the Shadow Squad. And I thought I'd be with the Shadow Squad for quite a while, because that's usually how it works. But um, after a game, just like, I, I remember playing really well. And they told me to move up to the, um, to the actual squad. And then a few weeks after that got signed. So yeah. And then I was with them till I was 17. And then um, I remember I tore my Achilles um, and I was out for a year. So it was hard to kind of like get back into it. And I remember I went to Birmingham and um, Birmingham City signed a scholar there. And then um, was at Birmingham for two and a half years, I think, um, until I, just after I turned 18, I think. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, from, from then I went, Loads of places. I went to Bolton on, on a trial. I played in Norway, played in Cyprus, came back, played for FC United. Um, 
and then I took I took took him a little while out to be fair like I didn't play for quite a while and then I went to Widdenshaw amateurs played there and then after that then I came to Paddock you know after Ronnie had spoke to me and said like uh, here's Paddock here's what they're doing and stuff and I was like I was interested in stuff so I thought yeah and since then I've quite had had quite a lot of fun with it to be fair yeah I think Nosa is absolutely fantastic as a player uh, as a bloke I think. There's a, a lot to really like about him. And he's a, another one that's been around the block a little bit. He's played in various countries. He's, he's tried his hand at various sorts of teams. And I think he's ready to try and get back in and do it professionally now. And he can. And I think a technical football team that plays football will be improved by Nosa. He's an intelligent player. He's a grafter. He's got some phenomenal movement the, the the movement and flair that he's got uh, honestly i really can't enthuse enough about how much i i appreciate what nosa brings to our team um and i'm gonna lose him i'm absolutely gonna lose him and i shouldn't have had him for as long as i've had him this season nosa had trials booked in in the conference conference north sides and i think maybe a year or two playing at the conference level, he could easily play in the Football League. League One, League Two, not a problem for him. His, his movement, his touch, it's sensational. And I think uh, a team that would allow him to do that, it's going to have to be a team that I think dominates the ball. And I think you get the right sort of side for that. He gets the right coach. He could easily play at that sort of level. COVID definitely screwed him. There were trials that he was meant to be attending and for whatever reason people limiting the bubble, limiting their exposure. Those trials, not just for Nosa, but for other players, just haven't happened this season. And it's probably not just Nosa, but probably an entire generation of lads that are coming to the end of their contracts now that might have played once or twice in the last year at the academy that they're at. They're going to find it hard to now move into a club. And, and Nosa's kind of in that. It might happen for him this summer, but there's going to be so many players coming out of a higher level there could be an entire generation that is either lost to the game or finds it really hard to get straight back in. Uh, being in a club at academies and playing at lower levels never really set me up to see the bad side of the game, which is um, someone telling you that you're not good enough, which is understandable because there's standards in um, the game, but the level of support that a player gets um, should be much, much higher. I wish it was higher for myself as well because it sent me into quite a bad place because I used to think that I weren't good enough to play football after years and years and years of just training and being the guy well known for playing football, all my friends asking me what club I'm at and who I'm playing for and I just couldn't answer because I didn't really feel like I was comfortable telling people that I'd got let go, let go from a club or gone to trial at a non-league club and not got in. So yeah, it was quite dampening and I feel like the support should be like much, much more. Some of these players when they've been dropped from academies and they find themselves out of the league and, and looking at, at clubs, you know, our level and, and a, a little bit higher to try and get back in the game. I wonder what that mental torture has been like. Not just Jay, but we've got lads here who, who have played for England. We've got three lads who played for England, at a variety of age groups. At one point, someone has said to them, not in words, but by actions, you are one of the best players in this country at that age group. That, that must internally make you go, well, I must be one of the best players in the country in terms of a percentage. Surely I can play Championship League One, League Two. If I'm good enough to play for England at any age group, I have to be good enough to be a professional at least. Uh, I fell out of love for football in the year of about 2018. So going into 28, this time in and around 2018, um, I'd fallen out of love for the game, mostly because I had things going on at home. Um, I had. My mum weren't feeling too well. I uh, had a nan who I was very, very close with, um, closer than anyone. Um, she had cancer. After beating cancer one or two times, kind of got to a stage where she weren't um, able to be here anymore. So she was kind of living her last days, her last summer and her last month. So that kind of put me in a, in a mindset of I'd, usually football would be the thing to get me away from how I was feeling. But I just wanted to lock myself away in the room. And it turned out that I didn't play football for a very long while and then that prolonged up until I moved to Manchester, which was 2019, where even after that, September 2019, I'd played about three or four five-a-side games all the way through to about the July before I came to Paddock. Um, when I came to Manchester itself, 
that side of life really hit me hard. It was me up here on my own uh, with my parts of my family, like my mum, my aunt, my sister, not being in the best of conditions for health, being up here, not being able to help and support and then kind of dampen me and put me in, in the worst possible place in terms of being in a dark place. And it just, football wasn't just the, the answer for me because I didn't know what to do and I didn't want to do anything at all. To be honest, it's the worst thing I've ever, ever faced. I came up here for a fresh start, thinking that my problems wouldn't follow, um, and my problems just doubled. And because I was up here by myself, uh, I met, I'd met like, some blessings in the form of people that helped me through everything. But at the end of the day in life, you only really have yourself. And I was struggling more than ever to just keep myself up. So like, there'd be days where I'd be awake seven days straight on a bounce without eating, without doing anything. And, my health was just getting worse and worse and worse. And it came to a point where I had to kind of question like, my will to live here, which a lot of people do go through. And I'm quite open to talk about because it is what it is. But um, yeah, there was a period that I'd come up to money and I just felt like alone, even with brilliant people around me, people I consider family now, like even with them around, I literally just felt alone and didn't really have the will to live um, much more, which takes its toll sometimes. But getting out of it kind of made me realise that I'd never go back there again. One of many things that made me rediscover my love for football was my uni course. Um, I was going into the Manchester City Academy near enough two, three days a week, um, kind of remembering and kind of like looking back on the football life I'd lived, where it was a thing if I played and I reached my full potential and I trained how I used to, then I could get back to how I was, if anything, better. Um, Obviously, I didn't play football throughout the whole summer, and then there was just a monthly period before I came to Paddock where I was just surrounded by good people. Um, one of my friends, Jordan, who's also a Paddock player, we went to just go and train, and from there, had someone say to me, oh, like, I'm a good player, and then started training, came to Paddock. Even a week of me coming to Paddock, um, I was still in that dark place for a very, very long while. Even throughout the whole season, I have been, to be fair. and. Being at Paddock is the one massive thing that's kind of brought me out of it because it's literally like I've fallen in love with the game like in ways I would never have imagined. Free kick there. Ooh, oh, it's wonderful. in. Keeper got a hand to it. Yeah, look at this, involved. look at this. Control, one touch, boom. As we see now, Gabini on the ball. He's played it over the top, that's a beautiful ball. Jay Phillips, top scorer for Paddock so far. Can he make it more? And yeah! he's made it more. Jay Phillips getting on the score sheet again. Uh, I, honestly, I don't know how I've kept hold of him. The goals are obviously the headline stuff with Jay. He scores a lot of goals. He scores spectacular goals. It's goals all day long. What you don't see about him is the hard work that goes into everything. He is relentless. And he's relentless in the WhatsApp groups. He's relentless. Myvering you, sending the videos of what he's done that day. But it underlines the, the dedication that he's got. And yes, you might see the goals on a Saturday, but trust me, the, there is stacks and stacks of sweat behind those goals. And there's a reason why he's been, um, he's probably a shoe in at the moment for player of the year at Stratford Paddock. And again, he's another player. I don't know why we've got him. I don't know why we've got him. I know there's trials in the very near future for him in the, in the next four weeks, actually. I'm very confident he goes and smashes those and I'm, I'm also pretty confident we lose him on the back of those. And I don't care, I'm happy. And I'm, it's, it's one of my proudest moments, I would say, with running this football club, that Jay has come and told us that he found his love for football again here. That's enormous. I can't tell you how much I think about that. It's, it's a lot. I feel like I still have very, very big dreams in football. Like, I still want to play at a high level. Um, I still want to make it into the leagues, um, sign another professional contract. Um, I feel like I am, I've been, I've been searching for like teams and obviously because of COVID at the moment, it's harder to like get trials and stuff like that. But I feel like I've got the right people around me at the moment. And um, a lot of people are helping me to achieve the goals that I want to achieve and I feel like I'm on a good path to get there. I do music um, on the side of football. You know, I'm, 
I make songs, I produce songs. I, I, t I taught myself on YouTube how to engineer music. So um, like anything, anything I think of, like, and I thought, think I want to do, I always go on YouTube and I, I figure it out myself. I like, as much as I like someone teaching me something to do, but I like learning it myself at the same time. Um, as well as that, I do fashion. Um, I'm working on a clothing brand called Bella Moore, which means beautiful love. And, um, you know, it's, like I said, again, it's like all my own designs. I taught myself on YouTube how to make my designs, um, best ways to produce, like manufacture stuff like that. So yeah, that's on the way as well. So stuff like that, I really, really enjoy, like, you know, putting my mind to things and creating something that's like unique to me and shows my personality, if you know what I mean, yeah. My dream in football, I'd say it's a little bit vague, um, but being realistic as an adult, um, I live up here by myself. I have no family, up, no blood family up here. Um, I'll tell you, my aim is just to carry on having fun with it because I feel like there was a time period where I might have got paid for football, but I weren't enjoying it. And for me to carry on playing football, whether I get paid for it or not, is a bonus. But the fact that I'm able to just have fun, even be here at Paddock and literally enjoy my football so much. Even posting that training videos and posting um, pictures from games and wherever else, like, I'm getting messages saying I'm inspiring people. So. It's a very, uh, very, very heartwarming thing to get because having been in like, the worst possible place and obviously not wanting to be here on multiple occasions, um, to have then come out of that place and come to a point where I'm still fighting whatever I'm fighting um, behind the scenes of how everyone sees me, but to then get messages to say that I'm inspiring someone else to come out of a dark place is quite a heartwarming. So um, yeah, that was it. Do you know what my dreams in football is just to see what happens. Um, right now, I, I know football, I know the industry, I know what it's like, I know what's required. And even though it may look like, oh, Ronaldo's dribbling past players at this <laughs> easy, easy level, um, I know that the step up is a lot larger than people think. And I wouldn't want to pursue that unless I know I'm ready. It's not like I'll turn down opportunities because I'm happy playing here at the moment and, enjoy, and enjoying it for what it is but if a really really good opportunity comes around to get back in a, level, a decent level of football I'd be stupid to turn it down but I'll need to do that when I'm mentally ready and I'm physically ready also because the physical and mental side of, of football as I said earlier is so, so important. Obviously we've all got ambitions, we've all got dreams, even at Paddock, coaching for Paddock, managing Paddock. We still have ambitions and levels and goals that we want to achieve and, and things that we want to realise. And I promise to do whatever I can do for the lads that are here. Um, and there's teams that have come in for the boys and the lads will tell you, I've passed all of them on and I've given my honest recommendation and whoever has asked, you can ask some of the lads themselves. I, I, I'll take a screenshot and show them exactly what I said about them. Um, and it's, it's generally positive because they deserve that. Now, some are, are probably going to be gone soon because of that and I, I wish them all the luck in their journey and I, I'm glad to featured in, in where they are in that journey and, and some have, have had some surprising offers, not in terms of who they are, but in terms of they've said no. And I can't fathom why they've said no and they want to stay at Paddock and for those, I'm grateful, though, they're more than welcome to, to stick around. They're, they're phenomenal players, but they're turning down good professional opportunities. That tells me there's more than meets the eye to this. Because I think myself, you guys watching at home, you hear of people getting an opportunity to play professional football and you go, both hands, yes please when these lads who've had those opportunities are turning them down, you have to question why. It's everyone's dream to be a professional footballer, except some of those who have been offered the chance. So that tells me that the game has got loads more to do, loads more to fix. And I think for whatever the reason there is that lads wear our shirt, I'm happy that we exist to, to satisfy those reasons and those desires. And, I knew that I was building a team here. I didn't realise I would be building a family. <laughs>